right, well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Rachel Barco, and I'm the faculty director of the Zimroth Center, and it's been a while since we have had an in-person event. Um, and so I want to first start off by uh, thanking Peter Zimroth and his family for both being here, uh, his daughter and his uh, uh, widow Estelle Parsons for being here and being part of an event that we finally get to put his name on that's in person, uh, which is uh, wonderful for us. Um, and I also want to thank our executive director, Courtney Oliva, for putting this together um, and to thank Sanjay Durasetti for fantastic preparation for this panel. Um, and I want to thank this panel uh, for choosing NYU to be a place where you talk about this really terrific book, Change from Within, for anyone who's interested in this movement uh, dynamic, whatever you want to call it, to elect prosecutors who are very much concerned with over-incarceration and finding sensible solutions to crime uh, and public safety, I recommend it to you. Um, so what we're going to do today uh, is we have three fantastic panelists, um, and I'll just go from uh, my right, uh, immediate right, we have uh, Sarah Fair George, who is the state's attorney for Chittenden County, Vermont, which includes Burlington as its, its biggest uh, city. Um, we have uh, Miriam Krinsky, who's the founder and executive director of Fair and Just Prosecution, uh, and so she is the, the lead author, editor, uh, compiler, uh, and contributor to the book. Um, and uh, Eric Gonzalez, who is uh, uh, the district attorney here in Brooklyn. Um, and so what I thought I would do is I'm going to ask them a bunch of questions, but I will open it up for you all if you have questions as we get towards the end to ask them as well. And I thought I would divide my questions into kind of three main areas. Um, so the first one I want to talk a little bit about politics. Um, since we just had an election, I can't help myself anyway, and I'm sure you all have some questions about the politics behind this kind of prosecutorial election uh, and the overall scope. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about office culture and how you get that to change um, and some policies that your offices are pursuing. Um, and then, as I like to do, I'll end on a downer, which would be the limits um, of what you all can accomplish or where you might find yourself facing some obstacles or impediments. Uh, and then I'll open it up to the rest of you. Um, so I'm going to kick it off. I'll start with you, Miriam, because you are the leader of the book. Um, and I, I wanted to talk about, so the title, is the reimagining the 21st century prosecutor. So I did notice it didn't say progressive prosecutor. Um, and so I'm curious whether or not that's an intentional move, um, but also just to get you to tell us, what do you see as the kind of key traits that all of the prosecutors in the book and anyone else that you would label this 21st century prosecutor reimagined share? Like what are the kind of key attributes you wanted to highlight when you put this book together in a prosecutor? Yeah, thanks, Rachel. And, and I also want to echo the thanks um, to those who helped support this work, um, to Rachel Yu and NYU, um, to our great partners at the Brennan Center who are also part of lifting up this important conversation, and, um, and to the FJP team sort of sitting in the back right over there um, for all the work in making this book and, and all that we do possible. Um, so we are very intentional in language and labels. Um, and uh, we do try to stay away from the label progressive prosecutor that some have adapted. And I think often those who adapt that label are using it in a way to try to marginalize or minimize the extent and reach of this movement, and, and it really is very much now of, I believe, a settled, here to stay, not going anywhere movement. Um, and I think they use it to try to attack the movement in many ways, and these amazing leaders that we very much wanted to be able to humanize and tell the stories of, because they are such incredible stories, and they are such incredible leaders in the book. Um, we don't believe that this is a movement or that these leaders are defined by any particular part of the political spectrum. So progressive is often used to presume that this is a far left um, kind of movement. We see these leaders coming into office in red states, in blue states, um, in urban areas, in more rural or smaller jurisdictions. We see them in New York, in California, and everywhere in between. And I think this last election that I know we'll have a chance perhaps to talk more about confirmed the extent to which communities want change. 
they don't want to find ourselves back in the punitive practices, the tough on crime era. Um, they very much exemplified the t period of time when I myself prosecuted in the 80s and 90s. Um, that was a time of failure. We failed people, we failed um, their families, their communities, um, and we, in the process, didn't make the public any safer. So we were wasting lives, we were wasting resources, and I think at times it's that wasted resources that often has brought, as well, fiscal conservatives to this conversation. They no longer want to see us throwing money away, fueling prisons and jails that simply churn people out and don't leave them at any greater likelihood of being um, less able to do damage to the community. In fact, if anything, these systems that we have in place tend to damage people to the extent that we know from research, from studies, makes them at a greater risk of doing damage, of being a concern to the community. So that kind of gets, I think, Rachel, sorry, to, to the what are the attributes. If they're not to be labeled in that way, we do like to think of them as 21st century prosecutors, reform-minded prosecutors, and they're very much defined through um, what we think is a blueprint that wonderful partners, um, some of whom are here today, helped in crafting, namely the 21 principles for the 21st century prosecutors. There, there are two anchors of that. How do we do less? How do we be more selective in where prosecutors use their gatekeeper function at the front door? So how do we avoid criminalizing individuals who are struggling with substance use issues or mental health issues or simply the manifestations of poverty? How do we selectively and smartly use the resources of the criminal legal system? And I think Sarah and Eric are such great examples of being smarter and where we need to do less within the criminal legal system. And while we're doing less here, how do we do more here? And the here that we do more of is fairness and transparency, procedural justice, accountability, post-conviction justice, which Eric is um, really led the nation in? How do we think about ways that the system can really promote this notion of doing justice, including addressing racial inequities that have been, you know, frankly, the mainstay stay of the criminal legal system for decades on end? So how do we address these issues while also being smarter about the size and scope and footprint of the criminal legal system? All right, excellent. Thanks, Miriam, for starting us off. So um, Sarah and Eric, I guess I want to talk to you both about how you make that into a campaign pitch, because that took a while, um, and no offense. Like, it does take a little while to kind of explain what it is you're doing, and you know, we have really quick campaign ads, really easy to just attack somebody for being too tough. So Sarah, I'll start with you, especially because those some of you might have seen, there was a New York Times article on bike thefts in Burlington. I don't know how many of you all saw it um, in the New York Times. And I, it was kind of a kind of classic media coverage of a crime, you know, they, interviewed people talking about what looked like the decline in Burlington, increased drug use, and gosh, you know, they had voted to defund some of the police department and cut positions, and you know, the suggestion was, now look, there's all these bike thefts and citizens aren't sure what to do. So in a climate like that, how do you win an election where your argument is to reduce the footprint of the do less, be smarter, um, if the attack is gonna be, how can you do less when we're facing what looks to be serious crimes? Thank you. Um, that's a big question, and it's, there really isn't a, a short answer, but one thing, I, I just had a contested election, um, a primary, a Democratic primary, that my opponent was very much coming from the right, um, using all of those same narratives. And the way that I ultimately was successful was by using facts and data and stories, and those, can sometimes be hard to put into a 30 second campaign ad. Um, and so one thing I tried to do is just be everywhere talking to people and having data and facts to support the things that we were doing. And bike thefts are a good example. There's actually no evidence that there's more bike thefts um, now than there ever have been. The difference is that the media, all the media talks about is that our police force is down. 
And you know, when I, I spoke with the author of that article for over 45 minutes, um, several follow-up calls, talking to him about exactly that and how, you know, yes, our police force is down, but so are our teachers, so are our social services, so is our housing. Um, our housing crisis in Burlington is, is phenomenal. And I gave him a lot of facts and numbers, and I'm sure none of you saw those in the article. Um, and so, you know, it is a constant battle to essentially outdo everything that your media is, is doing, and that's not just New York Times, it is all of our small media is doing the same thing, because talking about crime being up or police forces being down is really easy. Um, for, for not just for media, but it's also easy for the people that are um, on the other side of it. So police officers, for example, that were actively campaigning um, and not showing up at, at scenes and not showing up for calls and saying it was because I wasn't gonna prosecute things. So just going to those same people and talking to them about how, you know, the reality of the system. So facts and stories, I guess, is the, the short answer. And so far, you know, of, of all of us who have had re-elections, you know, there's a very, very small number who have lost and a significant portion who have not only won, but really won by overwhelming margins, um, including mine. I won by over 24 points and in every single jurisdiction in my county, including some that are, are quite, um, conservative. So it does, I do, I get caught up in it a lot, but I think for the most part, most folks see through it, which I'm very grateful for. Great. Um, so Eric, maybe I'll ask you to comment on something similar, but from a jurisdiction where I would bet you would find it harder to kind of go and talk mm -hmm. to people on a more personal level, since Brooklyn's kind of big. Um, and, and I guess I want to pitch it to you this way, if I can. So Lee Zeldin running for governor had said one of the things he wanted to do was remove Alvin Bragg if he were elected, and that was like a big part of his pitch. I didn't see you mentioned anywhere in any of the kind of New York crime, politicization, media, and you have a lot of the same policies that Alvin does, and so I guess I'd like to hear you reflect on how you have managed to avoid that same kind of onslaught that has really been directed his way, and, and how you negotiate this landscape where the media is constantly talking about crime and, and pointing to prosecutors as being part of the cause if they're too soft on it. So how have you successfully negotiated it in a place as big as Brooklyn? Hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been at this game a long time. I mm -hmm. think uh, that matters in terms of having credibility. Uh, I was the chief assistant to Ken Thompson, uh, and uh, prior to that had served as a prosecutor in the office I now lead uh, for 19 years, and so it's a lot harder, I think, to cast an image that I don't know what I'm doing or I'm, I'm soft on public safety because I've worked for so you know for such a long time uh, trying to keep communities safe. Uh, but I'm a kid from East New York, from Brooklyn, uh, and I grew up in East New York in the 80s and 90s during crack cocaine. Uh, living in East New York, which was called the murder capital of this great city we live in. And I saw firsthand uh, what that meant in terms of public safety and um, sense that the police department uh, you know, over-criminalized my neighborhood but underserved us at the same time. That message um, has been the message that I bring to the people of Brooklyn that you know the criminal legal system has to treat all parts of our community equitably um, and solve crimes. Uh, you know, places like East New York, Brownsville, you know, you can name five or six precincts in Brooklyn that are underserved in terms of, you know, having the type of response that you would get if a person was shot in front of NYU Law School. Um, that's not going to happen in the neighborhoods I live in. I also think being proximate to my community, I still live in East New York. Um, didn't move away, actually uh, moved back into East New York when I started working in the DA's office and raising my family there. So I, from a political sense, um, I'm not a newbie, and I think it's hard to uh, sort of shape a narrative around uh, you know, what my work has been and, and continues to be. 
but I also lead uh, more directly with values um, as opposed to policies. And I think that that is an important piece, leading with your values. And I think there are values that we share um, on the right and left. And one of those values is making sure that people who are convicted are actually uh, guilty and responsible for the crimes that they've been convicted of or that they receive due process in terms of you know, drug use and mental health. I think there's a lot of values that people believe that the system should provide assistance and help and not just be punitive. And you can go on, you know, values around unhoused individuals, how the system should deal with them. And so leading with those values, I think, has made it a lot um, more difficult to define me in negative ways. And I continue to do that. And that's how I uh, took over my office, um, started those conversations in my office with ADAs, the move from a more punitive prosecutor's office to a problem-solving uh, prosecutor's office has been about do we share values, and those values, do those uh, resonate with the residents of Brooklyn, and I believe they do. Can I, um, just to follow up on that, does it make it harder within your office to kind of get the prosecutors who work for you to do what you want when you keep the policies more value-based and open-ended as opposed to more specific? Is there a trade-off there then between kind of the political benefit of that and maybe easing people into it and the ability to more quickly get line prosecutors in your office to shift course, or do you find that they're consistent with each other? Uh, actually, I think that my office has been very effective in uh, not only in reducing crime in terms of uh, from 2015 to 2019 before COVID, we were down 30% in shootings and uh, about 20% in homicides uh, with a focus on policies that were designed to do two things, keep people safe in terms of you know, focus on drivers of violence. But a lot of my programming um, and my policies, internal policies, uh, were very directed at fairness and equity in the, in the criminal legal system. First DA in the country um, to hire immigration attorneys, um, to have an immigration policy about how we deal with pleas and sentence recommendations to prevent unfair deportation. First DA to stop prosecuting marijuana. First DA to you know, do a number of things in the state that have been uh, leading, I think, and allowing the legislature to look at Brooklyn and say, if, if Brooklyn can do it, uh, then the rest of the state can do it. And so in 2016 and 2017, with the help of Jill Harris, who's a proud graduate of this law school, um, we had a bail policy. And that bail policy um, reduced tremendously the number of people we were sending to Rikers Island. Um, and that bail policy, quite frankly, looks a lot like the policies that were designed by the legislature, but it allowed for ADAs to use discretion on cases where they believed uh, uh, bail was appropriate. All right, thank you. Um, so, Sarah, you mentioned in your chapter in the book, this part I did find fascinating, that you have been a waitress um, basically from the time you were a kid including after you were elected as district attorney, which, you know, for the students who are thinking about <laughs> the glamour aspect of district attorney, there is still time to continue to, to work as a waitress. So you kind of had that bird's eye view that the New York Times reporters love to do, which is like go to the diner and hear what people in the diner are saying. Um, so when you were in that position, what kind of feedback do you get from the people who see you in that capacity? What, what do you hear about, what are the, I guess the, complaints and praise that are the most common ones you get for this different kind of model of prosecution that you're bringing to the job? You mean literally when I'm waitressing? Yeah, just... yeah. I mean in a context um, where I'm assuming people are more inclined to kind of treat you as they can honestly tell you what yeah. they think. Maybe they can't, I don't know. These reporters make it sound like you go to the diner and you find out exactly yeah. what you know real Americans are thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I did waitress uh, every weekend until COVID actually, um, and only stopped because we all got laid off with COVID and then my loans, I hit my 10 year public service loan forgiveness um, during COVID, so I haven't had to go back uh, to waitressing, which is you know why I was doing it as much as I did love not having my cell phone on me for a weekend. It was really to pay my student loan debt, so that's a, a, another reminder. Um, <laughs> 
But I actually waitressed in the town that I grew up, um, about an hour and a half south of where I am the district attorney. So the people that I would serve there had known me since I was a kid and didn't really care that I was the district attorney because um, they'd known me my entire life. And then others had no idea because it's the number, it's the second tourist, most visited tourist location in the state. So they had no idea who I was. Um, but I will say that when, when that happens, you actually do get a lot, when people don't know who you are, uh, they tend to be, I think, even more honest. And so, you know, you always, I'm always surprised how many conversations I would end up having with people about, not necessarily crime, but certainly public safety issues and social justice issues, um, which of course go hand in hand. I always had a, a Black Lives Matter pin on my apron, and so that would always, um, you know, sort of start conversations with folks. And I, I really generally feel like this isn't a really f upscale restaurant, um, fine dining, and it's also right next to a ski hill. So like you really would have people coming in in tuxedos and have people coming in in snow pants. And to, to have that spread of folks that will talk to you about anything while you're serving them duck was, was really eye-opening for me to, to learn, both to be surprised that the people spending so much money for a lunch would have such real, like reasonable and, and views that I, you know, I think some people would be surprised by, and vice versa. Um, I tell myself all the time I think it made me a better lawyer, and I think it certainly made me a better prosecutor because it exposed me to so many different people and so many different conversations than I would have otherwise had. And, I never had that um, until entering politics. So Miriam, I would say that um, both Eric and Sarah are really good people people. You can see why they get elected. <laughs> um, they have great backgrounds. They're close to their communities. They understand them. So when prosecutors who are trying to develop this 21st century model don't get reelected or they do lose their election, what do you think are the common foibles? Is it all just very specific local circumstances and politics or is there something that you see as kind of common red flags or things that you would counsel someone who's thinking of running on this platform to look out for? Yeah, I'm, I'm so question. glad you went there with the lead in Rachel rather than, and, and what about the people in the book who aren't good people? Or, and, <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I would have said, oh, they're all right. equally wonderful, um, mm -hmm. and they actually are all equally wonderful. Um, you know, I, I guess I have a few thoughts, but in some ways it's hard to answer that, Rachel, because um, for two reasons. One, there have been very few losses in this movement. I mean, it remarkably so. Um, you really expect that with any movement that is predicated on winning elections, there are going to be, you know, as long as there's a continued trajectory upward, but there's still gonna be, you know, peaks and valleys. This one has largely been an ongoing trajectory upward. I mean, yes, there have been, you know, a few notable um, really heart-wrenching disappointments. Chase Boudin's recall was one of those. But again, it's hard to take too many patterns because of just how amazingly successful this movement has been in ways that, you know, five and a half, six years ago when our organization was starting up, people really, you know, kind of prepared me for the fact that, you know, you will win some, you will lose some. It's the cohort of elected leaders who manifest and, and in their heart believe in change is going to grow, but it'll grow at a slow pace because you can't expect this explosion when you've got elections as the trigger. The fact of the matter is we went from a table that Eric was at of 14 to today an elected group of now over 70 that we work with and they represent around 20% of the nation's population. So that's you know, a pretty compelling extent of growth. The, the other reason it's hard to generalize, but then I will try to draw some generalizations, is that every jurisdiction is unique. And I think San Francisco is a good example of that. You know, some will look at San Francisco and say, well, but that's just a bastion of liberalism. How on earth could Chase Boudin have lost his recall? The reality is, you know, San Francisco has the highest rate of billionaires in the world. So it is not, and, and it is a very 
homogeneous, you know, very low racial diversity in San Francisco. But even when you look to San Francisco, Chesa got more votes in that recall for him than he did when he was originally elected. So recalls are different and unique, and the few instances we've seen, and they have, are very few, and I can count them on one hand, where these leaders have not received the ongoing support from their community, have been very much unique, jurisdiction-driven. What do we see in terms of any patterns? You know, sometimes I think it's the inability or the lack of getting, continuing to get out into the community. And in Chase's case, the pandemic shut down the ability to continue that proximity that Sarah talked about to the community. And that then leads to the other thread that we sometimes see, which is when there is a strong wall of resistance from law enforcement and, and certain elements of law enforcement, often unions or some kinds of leaders in law enforcement, when there are some strong walls of opposition that then start to fund and get committed to your defeat, it is easy to then spin a narrative that's driven by fear and untethered to the data and the facts. And so that's also been a bit of a narrative, you know, an, an inability to really dissuade people, and they can't be dissuaded, and I appreciate Sarah's sort of facts, data, and stories, they can't be dissuaded by facts and data alone. Stories are so critical. Humanizing the success is so critical. And also quantifying and humanizing the failure of the criminal legal system, the damage that it does. So I think that's another thing, you know, in terms of maybe lessons learned or patterns, is that we do need to do more to try to lift up those human stories, to be out there in communities, and to be more successful in countering the fear narrative that often invests in trying to see these folks not have another term to do their work. All right, so last question for me on the politics is, it's interesting that both Eric and Sarah, you assume this job initially without an election um, for different mm -hmm. reasons in both your circumstances. Uh, and then, then we're up for election and won the approval of voters as well. And I'm just curious, do you think, and this is for both of you, do you think you would have done this if you had to be elected the first time around? Or was that kind of happenstance of first getting put in the job in a non-election capacity kind of critical for you? Uh, I can go first. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I would not have run. and. You know, I sought the, mine was an appointment. My predecessor became our attorney general halfway through the term. And so the position became vacant through an appointment process. And it was at the same time that a governor's race, we were getting a new governor and we didn't know who that was gonna be. And everybody that was seeking the appointment were folks that absolutely would have ran um, for the position. And from my perspective, you know, I was a deputy state's attorney in the same in the office that I now run, much like Eric, and so I did not like the options. <laughs> I didn't want those particular people to be my next boss. I felt like they were doing it only because it's a political position. Um, former predecessors of mine were Patrick Leahy, our senator, several um, several attorney generals. Uh, so I just I didn't want that for this position and. So I sought the appointment because I thought I'd have a better chance of getting it. And we did end up having a Republican governor win who is, is still our governor and nobody knew who I was. Nobody had any idea who I was. I wasn't entrenched in either party. And the governor, I think, saw me as the least risk um, politically because the others absolutely would have been political risks for him down the road. So. Um, I know for a fact he dreads that and regrets it now, but um, I'm still not, you know, I don't have any political aspirations beyond this, and I certainly, I would not have run for it, so I'm grateful that I had this opportunity. Yeah, for me, I, so I'm the first Latino district attorney in New York State history, um, and I don't, I know for a fact that I would not have considered running because I think part of the political, uh, you, know, you know, sort of nurturing is you have to see a path for yourself and you have to believe that there's something, you know, there. And, you know, quite frankly, out of the 62 DAs, 
in New York State, um, there were really just you know two African American DAs, and everyone else was either you know um, white. Um, so I had never really you know imagined running and raising money. Obviously, Brooklyn's a really large jurisdiction, uh, multi-million dollar race, and having been a career prosecutor, um, you know, no one owed me any favors in sort of the political world. I had stayed out of politics and had been just working, doing my job. You know, but ironically, it was the lack of, of representation that led me to run. Um, when my predecessor, Ken Thompson, who was the first black DA in Brooklyn's history, a uh, graduate of this law school as well, um, passed away, right before he passed, he asked the governor uh, to appoint me as the acting district attorney about a week before he passed. Uh, and there was a lot of political uh, maneuvering um, at that time. In fact, the governor was not going to appoint me. The governor was going to uh, replace me. And uh, it was communities of color in particular and the legal bar associations and others who wrote letters and advocated in the New York Times and I think even the Daily News said you have a career prosecutor in place, leave him in place, um, and then let the election cycle um, you know, happen. Don't you know, play politics with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. But much of the activism really came from the uh, minority bar associations and all the other affinity groups, and they inspired me to run. They said, Eric, if you don't run, we'll never get a Latino district attorney in the state of New York. You're in the best position to do this, and uh, held fundraisers and then sort of uh, put me on the map. So that activism was you know, uh, rooted in community, but prior to just sort of being the unfortunate passing of my mentor, I would have never imagined running for office. All right, so so you guys become, you know, politicians and have to become politicians mm -hmm. with this job. The other thing that you have to do when you take on a job like this is become an office manager, um, and you you have to get the people who work for you to to see your vision, to want to have that vision succeed, um, and so. We can go in any order you like, but what do you think have been the biggest challenges with getting career prosecutors in your office to buy into changes in policies that you've made? And you can either kind of tell me the policies that have been the toughest ones to get buy-in on or where you've just run into the biggest impediments internally within your office to getting people to go along. Because I know they're different office sizes and probably different dynamics, but I think it's fair to say, at least in every one of these DA offices that I've studied or talked about, and Miriam, you have the best view of anyone on this, uh, this has been a problem in every single one of them. Because um, you know you become the district attorney, but the people People who work there might think you might not stay in that job <laughs> or they might have been in their job longer than you've been in yours um, and so there's resistance from within so where have you faced the most resistance from within and what have you done about it we can start with you Eric and okay sure so I realized that this was going to be a challenge um, you know trying to change an office of anywhere between you know 530 to nearly 600 lawyers and another you know 500 to 600 staff members changing sort of the approach th that they brought to the job was going to be a tremendous challenge and so we when i was running for district attorney and when i was the acting da in 2017 we worked on something called justice 2020 and it was you know a, it was really an opportunity uh, to invite people to have a discussion about what's the criminal justice system in Brooklyn that they would like to have. And then we had you know, people from all walks of life on this uh, committee. In total, I think there was like you know, somewhere between 60 and 70 people who were involved and there were different subcommittees and they came up with a bunch of recommendations and four general sort of, you know, pillars of the Justice 2020 platform, which was, you know, reducing incarceration, our reliance on incarceration and convictions, uh, working close, more closely and engaging community, uh, transparency and data, 
um, and then a public safety plan about how we were going to keep people safe, which was focusing in on the small number of uh, really truly violent people who live in our communities. And that was the policy, um, but the implementation of that was challenging. So we had weekly Justice 2020 meetings, um, and we continue to have town halls, both externally with stakeholders, but internally with our office, and we brought in people to do trainings, and we uh, started to talk about, um, you know, rethinking our incentive structure. How do we write evaluations? How do we reward people for good work? Um, traditionally, my office had been rewarded by the number of trials and convictions people received. And you know, we started to uh, acknowledge people for e examining their caseloads and saying, you know, this is a case that I really have real concerns about actual guilt and, and highlighting that kind of work just as opposed to just convictions. Uh, so there was a lot of, you know, intentional uh, thinking about how do you um, move the culture, right? And sort of we talked about this narrative politically, we had to talk about that narrative internally that it's not just simply about how quickly you can process your cases and, and move your caseloads, um, but really you know, what are you hoping to accomplish with each and every case? And I've asked the ADAs really to think about that um, very directly, like when this case lands on your desk, what are your goals for this case? What would, you know, what does public safety look like on that case? And um, what does, you know, fairness look like in that case and public trust? And so I think that that narrative, um, you know, really sort of defined the work and then we started to recruit uh, people out of law school who wanted to do the work. But in terms of like, you know, real challenges, um, like, you know, I had an appeals bureau that, you know, was very experienced and excellent appeals bureau. Uh, 30 years, most of the lawyers had been working there close to 30 years. Um, and their, you know, their initial reaction was to challenge things on you know, standing and challenge on, you know, well, they've missed the window to appeal. And, um, and so there was a real battle um, to kind of say, like, you know, we just don't want to um, go to court uh, and fight to preserve uh, cases if there was, uh, you know, something worth uh, litigating. And so I started to, and as a policy on a lot of these cases, consenting to hearings and 440s and things that traditionally we could have probably uh, prevailed on, you know, standing grounds or on being untimely. And that was a real challenge for the thinking of a lot of our appellate lawyers who were just very procedural um, and think very procedurally. Um, and I had to say, well, we want to handle this stuff differently. And so some people left. Um, but ultimately, um, I think that's what the chief executive of a DA's office has to do at some point, which is, you know, try to have discussions and, and have uh, buy-in. But at some point, uh, if people are just too resistant, you invite them to leave or retire. Can I, just to follow up on that. so. You know, there are some reports by court watchers and others that some prosecutors in your office are still seeking fairly high bail amounts in cases. Um, and since you, like publicly at least, have, have argued that you, you want to be less reliant on that, what do you do about something like that to try to control the line prosecutors exercising their discretion for still seeking high bail amounts, you know, particularly when Rikers is as dangerous and awful as it is. So seeking those bail amounts means sending people to a really unsafe and horrible space. So what, what do you do with that to try to get prosecutors to stop seeking those high amounts or to change their vision about pretrial detention? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very challenging uh, it's a very challenging uh, position because, you know, I've advocated openly and publicly of eliminating cash bail and, and having a system that would um, take money out of, uh, the, you know, who gets detained and who doesn't. And I've, you know, actively supported bail reform on the state level, but there's not the political willingness um, to get rid of cash bail and, you know, the system that's been created is, you know, this bifurcated system where if it's a violent uh, felony, it's, it's eligible for bail. If, you know, if it's nonviolent or a misdemeanor, bail is not eligible unless it's 
now the list is a sort of been rearrested, um, and the case is still pending. So, you know, we have to continue um, to push forward that legislative priority and convince people that a cashless, a cashless bail system um, is sound policy in this state. Um, but in terms of uh, working within the very limited system that we have, you know, we review bail applications and um, there have been a number of occasions when we thought the bail wasn't, uh, was too high. We've reached out to defenders and said, hey, we're willing to sort of uh, figure that out. And during COVID, I think, was the best example. Uh, we had, you know, thousands of people in New York City on Rikers Island, and we worked with defenders day in and day out and our judges to re reduce the Rikers population by 30%, uh, consenting to different types of relief. Uh, but we need the city to do more. I mean, quite frankly, uh, the city has to have uh, housing for people who don't need to be on Rikers Island, people with mental health issues, and others who we can safely remove. Um, and, and so we have to continue to advocate for that. And we had this meeting you know, with the mayor's office because uh, they were going to get rid of some of that housing options that um, and we really asked the mayor not to do it. And he has agreed to have more housing for people with mental health issues um, and, and to continue to think about other ways to reduce that population on Rikers. Uh, including electronic monitoring and others. And so everything comes with a problem. EM is not the best solution, but it's better than uh, Rikers. You know, but for me, uh, in terms of people who have long criminal histories and have you know, created great harm, um, I have to do something uh, as district attorney to hold them accountable and make sure that they're um, not going to hurt others. And so it's a, it's a difficult situation because it's not what most progressive prosecutors want, which is a, a cash money system, uh, because we realize the fallacy of that system, which is if you're violent and can afford to pay money, you're out, but if you're violent and can't afford to pay money, you're in. And so we have to continue to advocate for that. So, so Miriam, if I can ask you about a specific example, but you can tell me if there's another one you want. The book has lots of references to restorative justice in it and the various offices approach to using that as an alternative model to the traditional resolution of cases um, and I know it looks different in different places but for those of you who don't know you know it's, it's basically a way to get the um, the perpetrator of the offense and the survivor together in a more mediated session to try to figure out you know how to remedy the harm that was caused um, and so and it you know, it could mean that you're completely diverted out of the system. It can mean, you know, a different kind of accountability than incarceration. Um, what kind of pushback do prosecutors face in the various offices that have tried to put in restorative justice? Because I, I suspect the, the book paints a sunnier picture than I'm imagining <laughs> might be below the surface in some of these offices when the prosecutor comes in and says, we're going to use a circle and we're going to have the perpetrator and the survivor get together and work out the differences. So how do they deal with that and where is it most resisted? Right. Um, well, we always try to be sunny. Um, maybe some of that is coming from California. But um, I mean, that is a great example, Rachel. And, and I think the question you asked Eric about bail policies is also a good example because, you know, a leader can come in and they can create great policies, but if they only live on paper, it's not really making a difference. And so how do you hardwire change in the office? And, and you know, you almost could have said change from within equals resistance from within, <laughs> but, um, but, but how do you start to pivot in, in kinds of offices where the people who populate them, and, and I saw this as well, spending five years working on law enforcement reform, including a year inside the largest law enforcement department in the country, an 18,000 person sheriff's department, when you are dealing with people like lawyers and prosecutors in particular, and law enforcement is the same way, who are rule followers, they don't like change. They really don't like to mix it up. And something like restorative justice, that's almost like the change you know, that has horns on it. Um, what are you talking about? We're gonna sit around in a circle and sort of try to listen to each other and not just drag everybody into court with someone up there with a robe handing out orders. And so 
These are big changes, but I think restorative justice is a perfect example of how do we recognize that this very sort of straight and narrow with all of its fine lines and lanes criminal legal system, it doesn't heal people. It doesn't do right by survivors of crime or communities that have suffered. In fact, communities that have suffered most have been most supportive when you look at the polls and the election results of these kinds of changes. So how do you sort of bring in this new paradigm and, and shake it up and bring about change not just from the top down but also the bottom up? You know, I think it's a couple of things, Rachel. I, I think, you know, I think some of it is exposing people to a new way of thinking and bringing in all kinds of validators that can maybe meet them where they're at. So maybe it's gonna be other prosecutors from other offices, colleague to colleague, who can say, I did this and it's different and it works. Maybe it's survivors who can say, I better feel healed by this and it works. Maybe it's law enforcement leaders who've become believers or maybe it's simply as they did in DC in the Attorney General's office when they put restorative justice in place, they brought in the choir, the people who believed in it, to run those programs. Mm -hmm. But then they just had line prosecutors sit and watch. And people were stunned when they walked away by the extent to which it actually seemed to have some benefit and, and to work and to be able you know, to lift up the needs of those who have been harmed and to provide a better pathway for those who had committed the harm to understand and acknowledge the harm and find a different way forward. So some of it, I think, is proximity and exposure. Some of it is changing from the bottom up. And how many of you here are law students? Okay, we need you. I mean, they need you. The only way to sustain so, the change is by bringing in a new generation of leaders. And we have information out there on the table on a summer fellows program. We now have over 100 alumni in our summer fellows program who have spent summers in these offices and are going out in whatever they do. They may go back and work in these offices. They may run for office. We've already had one summer fellow in Vermont run for office. Or they may just go off and do something else but understand the need to change these systems. And some of it is going to be what Eric talked about, which is if people can't really understand the need for change, making personnel changes. You know, at some point, if people are not on board, you need to just kind of cut the losses and get new people in place who are more willing to embrace it, while also trying to show proof of concept, whether it's through data, whether it's through research, whether it's through new metrics that differently define what does success look like and what does the office value as opposed to just counting convictions and caseloads and guilty plea rates, but actually changing metrics and definitions of success where you value how often are people embracing restorative justice, what are they doing around post-conviction justice. So I think it's elements of all of those that can shake it up a little bit. Can, can I also add that, and I, Miriam definitely touched on it, but for my office, um, with our restorative justice work, it's been really centered around uh, what victims and survivors want, and I actually think as a, you know, a victim's right uh, law, and so in a lot of contexts, we've really um, have marketed that to our lawyers um, and to our community, especially when there's been pushback about why is this like a restorative practice, this is not, you know, this is letting people off the hook too easily who've committed offenses and said for such a long time, the conversation has been about victims' rights and what victims want and here's a program that actually uh, is really dealing with the trauma and the hurt and much of the uh, issues that victims have in our criminal legal system and why would you be resistant to that? Um, why wouldn't you give the survivors of these crimes the agency to decide what works best for them? And I think that that's been very persuasive internally to my lawyers. Of, of course, you have to show them how this, you know, the programs work. Um, but in Brooklyn, um, you know, we are you know, using uh, restorative practices not just on kids and, and low-level cases 
but on really serious violent felonies where um, victims have opted in to this work. And I think it goes without saying that, you know, in places like Brooklyn where there's a lot of violence, those are often in communities of color. And, and there's, you know, a lot of feelings in those communities that we don't need another black or Hispanic person in, in prison um, or another family ripped apart. We need solutions. Uh, we need the person not to harm anyone anymore and, and to um, be a, a safe member of our community. And so saying that, you know, we have programming around these issues to have people avoid prison and come back into our communities and um, with being a better neighbor um, is something that there's a lot of support um, to once people understand that it's actually um, something that the victims are asking for in these cases. And so um, what I tell my ADAs, and I think this is critical, is when that first conversation with a victim, um, don't tell them this is a case that looks like three and a half years or five years. Um, listen, hear what they want, um, um, and then say, you know, they're gonna get a phone call from one of our social workers, and a lot of that work is not between the assistant DA and the survivor, but it's our social workers and some of the people in our office that deal with restorative justice practices and kind of have that conversation about what they're looking for in that case. Um, and I think that that is an important piece because in my career when I was trying cases, I often would ask a victim what they wanted and they would say, well, I don't know what the case is worth, like what happens in these type of cases. And so it's often prosecutors are setting this thing that it's only serious if we're asking for jail. It's only a serious thing. And so we're training our lawyers to have different conversations about accountability that don't look like uh, jail sentences. So Sarah, where, where would you say the pushback has been? So when I was reading some of the policies that you have implemented, um, not charging drug possession cases, either not charging or diverting them, or using restorative justice in domestic violence cases, or no cash bail. You have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so of the various policy shifts that you've made, where have you found the most resistance within your office, and how have you addressed it? I've, I feel like I've, you know, like, I feel like I've been really lucky to not have a lot of resistance within my office, and I think for two reasons. One, because I was a prosecutor in that office before I became the state's attorney, I had you know some street cred um, with my staff that I knew what was working in our courthouse, I knew what, what wasn't, and I was able, when I took over, there was actually a fair amount of vacancies, and I filled almost all of them with public defenders um, and one person from our, our local legal aid. So, I didn't have to convince any of them why I was implementing these policies. But another part of it was that I didn't do a single policy without involving my staff. Um, from the very beginning, I would ask them for recommendations, ask them for ideas, things that they might be seeing around the country or, um, or even reading about and want to talk to me about. And then we as a staff would develop the policy and Oftentimes, like with our cash bail, we actually implemented the policy internally months before we announced it so that we could find out if there were times where maybe we did need to ask for cash bail and we didn't want to have made this big announcement that we're never asking for it. So, um, And the benefit of that was to be able to then say, well, all of the things that you're now saying are going to happen, we've been doing this for nine months now and none of that happened and you didn't even notice. Um, so I, I think in the way that you implement some of the policies can help with the pushback. Actually, I think that the biggest change that we did internally that I, I don't know that pushback is the right word, but definitely the, the thing that was hardest for my staff was to no longer use the term defendant. Um, we never use the term internally, so everybody is called by their, you know, their name. It's such, a, it's such a simple thing, but it was actually the thing that I think all of us, including myself, struggled with more than anything else. And that, I didn't learn to use that term when I became a prosecutor. You know, I, I learned it in rooms like this. I learned it in law school. I learned it on TV, watching Law and Order. You know, those, those are those dehumanizing 
um, the dehumanizing language is something that we've just known for so long um, that I think that was actually the thing that people have struggled with the most. That's interesting. Um, so you said you hired people who were previously public defenders, and so I'm gonna go a little off my list here because <laughs> that is one of the questions that I wanted to ask all of you particularly. You know, some of our students, I think, when they think about where they can go to kind of make their communities better and bring about social justice, I'm increasingly seeing a concern that the prosecutor's office is not the place to be to do that. Um, but one thing that's very interesting about the book is reading the backgrounds of all the people who contributed chapters, including all of you, um, in terms of your own personal backgrounds um, coming you know, from communities that have themselves uh, had experiences with with crime. Um, Miriam, you're the child of a Holocaust survivor. I mean, the, the, these are very personal um, experiences with communities at, that have seen the brunt of, of crime and all the harm that it causes. And you've chosen to kind of go into a prosecutor's office and you convince people who are public defenders to come into your office. So what's the pitch to a student who is, says, why would I go to a prosecutor's office if the, what I really wanted to do was bring less harm to these communities who have really borne the brunt of mass incarceration? What do you, how'd you get those people to come join you? Yeah, I mean, I went to law school to become a public defender. Uh, that is the entire reason I went. I was getting my master's degree in forensic psychology and I realized that there was very little to no justice in the justice system and so I wanted to become a public defender to dismantle it, to do what I could to dismantle it. And I was doing a clerkship during law school at the public defender's office and I was so excited to have that job. It was the office I wanted to be in when I graduated and I had clients and you know, sort of long story short, I had two clients and each one had a different prosecutor assigned to it and one was phenomenal and did exactly what was right to do and ultimately dismissed all of my clients' cases after we engaged him in services and he got housed and employed and he's now a very successful community member. And the other prosecutor in that same office that I now run absolutely refused, demanded the convictions. We went to trial, he was convicted, he got a fine that he could never pay and he died of a drug overdose. And that experience for me was enough to recognize that if I wanted to dismantle the system, I had to be the one with the power. And public defenders play an incredibly important role and I'm super grateful for them, um, but they are ultimately at the mercy of the compassion and care and mercy of the people making the ultimate decisions. And I think as prosecutors, our, our greatest power is to not bring charges at all, um, to not bring people into the system at all. And so a public defender is never even involved. Um, we make 100 choices before a public defender ever, ever knows about a case. So that's my pitch. And Again, when I became, I had been a prosecutor for about seven years beforehand, and so I had been working with the public defender's office um, for a very long time. And so when I switched over, or when I became the state's attorney and was pitching to them, um, it, I didn't really need to make the pitch. You know, they, they knew why it was important to be in our office instead of theirs. I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on that one. Or... I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll echo what Sarah said you know, when you're a, a public defender, you have an obligation to a client, and of course, you know, organizations like Legal Aid or Brooklyn Defender Services in Brooklyn can do national litigation and, and change policies um, and make the system better. But, you know, it, it's so critical um, for the administration of justice that people come into a prosecutor's offices with their different uh, life experiences and um, that the office actually has different thinking thinkers and people especially people come from diverse backgrounds um, that you know the representation when you walk into court uh, when I was in the Brooklyn DA's office in the, in the you know mid 90s um, you know, there were very few people of color in that office, and, and today my executive team is probably, you know, 70 percent women and people of color, um, and my management team is about a third uh, people of color, um, and it comes with different life experiences and, and more openness um, to think differently and handle cases differently, and people who are interested in, in doing uh, 
you know, who think they want to be a, a legal aid attorney or a public defender, um, having that position in the DA's office um, to advocate for policies internally uh, makes a big difference. I mean, the reason Ken Thompson selected me to be his chief assistant district attorney is because I had a reputation in the Brooklyn courthouses. And it's a big system, over 100,000 cases a year, that I thought differently than a lot of the other people who worked in that office. Um, and so there's that need um, for people who don't j just want to lock people up and throw them in prison to be in the prosecutor's office, to be that change from within. Um, many of the DAs who are very successful in, in Miriam's book are people who have uh, previously held that position as a prosecutor. And I think you can do both. I think you can um, be a defender and be a prosecutor and go back. Um, there are some people who say I could never um, you know, put someone in prison even for a day, then probably a prosecutor's office is not for you unless you're in the policy space. Um, but for those who really want to think about what if a fair and equitable criminal legal system sh can look like, we need you, we need you in the DA's office. So that's my you know, request to the law students to really give it some thought, just mm -hmm. do some soul searching to see whether or not you can make a difference in a prosecutor's office. Rachel, can I add a few thoughts as well? I mean, these guys, I think, are such great examples of, of why there is this different moment in prosecution. And, and they're actually the exception to those profiled in the book. I think, you know, other than Dan Satterberg, who was another sort of career prosecutor, they very much changed his thinking. Kim. Uh, Kim uh, and, and Kim Fox, although Kim had Rachel gone Rollins, out. Rachel Rollins, I think, too, right? Rachel kind of. I mean, I, I'm not yeah, sure she yeah. would think of herself as a career <laughs> prosecutor. Um, but many of the folks in this book and many of the DAs we work with have spent a career as innocence lawyers, public defenders, um, civil rights lawyers, community leaders like Satana DeBerry, you know, and, um, and others. I, I mean, one of the Mark Gonzalez, you know, not guilty is too tattooed on his chest. And, you know, I, I think people asked Mark, you know, are you gonna get the tattoo removed now that you're DA? And he said, no, now it matters more because everyone needs to take to heart and is literally over his heart that people come in with a presumption that they're not guilty. You know, I think our Blue Sky at FJP is a time where people are floating between those two jobs. Um, we, as part of our Summer Fellows Program, encourage our fellows to think about splitting with the Public Defender's Office in another jurisdiction. And we have had a few now who have split with the Public Defender's Office or some kind of other, you know, sort of civil liberties, civil rights group. Um, I think we need excellent public defenders. We also need young prosecutors who have every bit of that passion and don't believe they could ever feel comfortable convicting or putting somebody behind bars. It should come with that huge discomfort. And I remember back to, I think it was the day after Larry Krasner was elected, we sat up here with a panel. I think, Eric, you were on that panel. Tony Thompson was moderating. We all gave Larry applause because he had just won, just been declared the victor, first election the day before. Tony asked him that question. You know, Larry, it was almost exclusively students in the office. These are folks who want to be public defenders. Tell them why they should ever feel comfortable coming and working for you. And Larry said, you know what? If you really want to shake things up, come and spend a couple years with me. And sure enough, there are those who have, and often it's a tough job. They won't last more than a couple of years because it is not an easy job, but wow, can they make a difference? And wow, can these leaders make a difference? With the stroke of a pen, things overnight can be different. No more death penalty, no more kids in the adult system, no more seeking of life without parole or three strikes enhancements. You know, no more cash bail, thinking about the immigration consequences, treating kids as kids, you know, so much more with a stroke of a pen can happen with people in these offices. Right, so I want to make sure if uh, there are questions from the audience, I still have a bunch more, so I'll fill the time if you don't, but I want to give you an opportunity um, and we'll come around with a microphone if you put your hand up high enough so that Courtney can see it. Hi. Maybe this is good? It's on, yeah. 
the, the greatest day of my life was when I found out my attacker got bail and he was set a high bail, $100,000 bail. He not only put a gun in my face, but victimized multiple women, multiple people in his neighborhood, up until the point where he was charged with attempted murder. And unfortunately, because of the new bail laws, the trial court part TAPA and TAPAB, his violent felony was eligible for uh, assault too now. But luckily, because of my impact statement and the work that we would continue doing, in hopefully with the ADA, we were gonna make sure his case will be remand eligible. And the best part was when, the best, when I found closure was when I spoke to that ADA and he, ha he held me at the same level as him. Y you understand? Thank you. So maybe I can just um, use this as a launch pad to ask you all what you think best practices are in an office for victims and survivors and how to address their needs. If there are things that you have done within your office that you want to highlight that you think the 21st century reform prosecutor is doing to address people who have been, you know, through really traumatic, awful incidents, what your office sees as the, as the way forward there. And thank you for your statement first of all I'm very sorry for what happened um, to you and um, it's you know why you know about a month ago I announced in Brooklyn a, a tremendous structural um, change in my office forever Brooklyn um, you know I don't think it's ever been different had two divisions we had a you know basically the trial division and sort of the investigative investigations division um, and you know, about a month ago now, I announced that we were creating a, a third division within the office, which was the uh, division of uh, gender-based violence. Um, and largely, you know, my thinking about progressive prosecution, and I think I mentioned this in, in the very beginning, is that there, there have been communities that have been underserved uh, by this legal system and gender-based violence is one of those. So in my office, gender-based violence will uh, incorporate domestic violence and sex crimes and, and crimes against children, uh, human trafficking. We also will have the, the U visa program and our victim services unit uh, as all part of this new division uh, to make sure that we're advocating um, for people who have been marginalized or not believed or not given the amount of uh, uh, protections that other places have had. Um, and, and I think that that's important. You know, I speak often about uh, and non-fatal shootings and other places about getting those uh, communities the same amount of justice that, you know, more wealthy and resource communities get. And it's an important message for prosecutors to always say that people have to um, be treated fairly on both sides of the ledger. They have to be um, treated uh, uh, seriously when they're victims of crime and they have to have that agency about what they want. Um, and so I, I think that that's a, a big piece of this progressive movement is understanding that there have been people who have been marginalized by this justice system and that um, we have to hear their voices and we have to elevate their voices and uh, that's what I'm hoping to do with my new um, gender-based violence division. Sarah, can I ask you, I, um, in addition to thinking about, um, there's state-based violence, and I know one of the things that you did was address abuses that were taking place within the detention facility for women mm -hmm. and cracking down on that. When you seek to address violence that exists at the hands of the state, police, corrections officers, that's a tough political dynamic. Did you face pushback when you targeted the abuse that was taking place within the detention center um, as, a, as one of your policies? Yeah, absolutely. So we had, I actually think it was the last time I was at NYU Law. I think that right before then it had come out that um, there was just rampant um, sexual misconduct occurring at our women's facility, which is in my jurisdiction. And, you know, of course, I, I think we all just understand, not accept, but understand that there's misconduct occurring in our jails, but the 
the women that came forward and actually told their stories was incredibly heartbreaking and, and, and infuriating. And so I did launch an investigation into the misconduct and also reviewed every single case of a woman that our office had, had put there, essentially, uh, to see what we could do to get them out. And we resentenced most of them um, to, to get them out of jail. And it obviously came with some, some significant pushback, but when you do, you know, I think that part of the problem that we face as a as sort of a nation is that we we constantly demonize this sort of reform of our system in the name of victims until the victims don't want that same thing, um, until the victims don't want their offenders in jail, or the victims are people who are in jail, then uh, we we no longer care about what victims want, and so. I spent a lot of that time just lifting up what those women had been through as victims of sexual violence in the jails and sexual misconduct, and also the fact that most women who are incarcerated, and this is nationwide, a majority of those women are victims of domestic and sexual violence before they were incarcerated. Um, and so talking about that, and if you really care about victims of violence, you should care about getting these women out of jail. You should care about not incarcerating women to begin with. Those are, so again, just sort of using some of that same messaging about victims back to the community is, I found to be ultimately very successful. Um, and none of the, the women that we released from jail during that went back. Um, so obviously also good data. <laughs> I think there was a, was there another hand in the audience? Judges, uh, to what extent should they be made a part of the public discussion of these issues? To what extent might the culture of the judiciary affect prosecutors in achieving their objectives? Great question. Yeah, it's only been fairly recently that there's been any conversation about judges um, and in a lot of the uh, places where these prosecutors have been challenging uh, the status quo, um, it's been judges, frontline judges, who've been part of that resistance. Um, and we have to have more conversations um, about how we either elect or get judges um, appointed who uh, are not just going to you know, hold the status quo. One of the things in Brooklyn that we did early on in my tenure was to change some of our default policies. So, for example, um, we used to ask as a matter of just just practice I mean, from the time, you know, from the 90s on, at least as far as back as I know, that on every conviction, the default policy was to ask for the maximum period of parole. And it, it was a it was such an ingrained policy that our public defenders didn't even challenge that policy. They just knew that whatever they pled guilty, uh, there was no negotiation about how much time you know we were going to ask for parole it was always just a given it would be the max period and when i started to think about post you know justice conviction and, and re-entry and the things that trap people in the criminal legal system i said why are we asking for the max on every um, parole case not every pro you know not every case deserve that there's not even the need really for a lot of these uh um, folks to have the maximum period of parole and you know that was a difficult conversation for a lot of our judges who had just been imposing the maximum period forever and so that's an important piece and we have to start engaging our judiciary in fairness to them um, they often are not allowed to speak for themselves um, and they're really uh, controlled and censored by the Office of Court Administration in here in, in New York State but it is a conversation that needs to happen. And, and I can go on about some of the default policy changes that we had where judges were more of a resistance um, than they needed to be. When I first moved to vacate marijuana uh, convictions, um, 
you know, it was judges who were preventing that. You know, we would, they would not grant the applications, and we had to figure out different ways to get those. You know, before New York State had a a policy to vacate marijuana, old marijuana convictions, we were doing that uh, one case. I wanted to do a mass application. The simple part is, I wanted to do a mass application with our legal aid and Brooklyn defenders, and the judges wouldn't grant it, um, even though there was no opposition. And so we had to go do one case at a time and argue individualized uh, you know facts um, and I, I could imagine in other places where that mass application uh, with the district attorney and the defenders on board on those individual clients would be granted so it's a, a tremendous part of this conversation about criminal justice reform if anyone else wants to wait well right. I, I I think that's a great question. I think the same question could be asked of other partners in the criminal legal system. Um, you know, the, the, the change that elected prosecutors can achieve can very easily be stymied by others. You know, it can be stymied by judges. It can be stymied by a governor or a state executive who doesn't see things the way the executive, uh, the prosecutor does. And in some states, you know, Florida is an example, New York could have been an example, there is unusual authority of governors to try to remove elected prosecutors. It can be stymied by an attorney general in the state who sees things differently. It can be stymied by a law enforcement leader who, despite these policies, will continue to hit the drumbeat of arresting people for marijuana. Uh, possession cases or other sorts of, of things that you know these folks believe is not a good use of limited resources, um, including you know sadly these days in some states where um, we're seeing efforts to criminalize reproductive choice or transgender care for you know by parents for their their children. Um, so there can be different points of pushback. It can be stymied by a parole commission or a Bureau of Prisons or corrections leaders or probation officials. But I think one thing we're seeing more and more is that as communities are demanding something different, there are constituencies in all of those areas I just identified that are embracing a new way of doing business in the criminal legal system. And I think whatever can be done to try to seed that change is going to help make the ability of these leaders who have tremendous clout and tremendous ability to effectuate change, better enable them to keep sort of rolling that boulder up the hill. So can I, a related limit to what you all are trying to do, and it's, you know, I think we see this everywhere, is you want alternatives to using the criminal punishment process to address what are really social problems, poverty and homelessness and uh, mental health issues. So to the extent that you're relying on alternatives to punishment to deal with those, but there aren't resources for those things, you know, what do you do, particularly when you have something like how I viewed a big part of Chase and Boudin's recall was, you know, you have a huge problem in San Francisco of unhoused people, um, and voters there basically blamed him for that, even though it's like not his jurisdiction. It's, but in case you're curious, San Francisco looks the same after his recall as it did mm -hmm. while he was in office, right? It's just not something he can control. And similarly, yeah. you can't control those kinds of things as the district attorney, but you could be blamed for it, particularly mm -hmm. when you're kind of running or talking about your job as a space to find alternatives for people. So how do you kind of negotiate that tension between you want to find other solutions, but you're not in control of the other solutions? I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I'll jump in because I think, you know, New York City, you know, many of you um, follow it more closely uh, in terms of what we've seen in terms of, you know, people with mental health issues, uh, um, random attacks on our subways and other things that make people feel really insecure and, and you know, prosecutors have been blamed um, because we're, you know, not being aggressive enough in taking people with mental health histories and, and prosecuting them and throwing them in prison. You know, I think there's a lot. I'm actually fairly optimistic that um, the work that, you know, my office is supporting with community violence intervention, the CVI work, is a real way that we can start to move um, the system forward to a real sense of what public safety means. 
uh, feels like and what the values of our community are by putting more of the onus on our community partners um, to help solve a lot of these problems that they have in their community. So what I've done in Brooklyn is to really uh, promote the work of, of CVI um, and have implemented and, and have put part of my budget towards that work and uh, supporting uh, community violence into uh, interrupters and other community-based organizations who are on the ground working in these fields. Um, so in Brooklyn, we've done different things uh, with community partners. We have actually a pretty exciting uh, program starting in Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, where we're working uh, with gang members and we're trying to create a restorative justice circle between these gang members so that they can come to their own understanding and their own truths and, and lay down guns. In Brownsville, we're working with the Brownsville Safety Alliance and having community violence interrupters responding to 911 calls. But I think that a lot of the work is going to really, and the solutions to our system, are going to not come from law enforcement or the district attorney's office, but are gonna come from stakeholders. So I've been out there promoting funding um, and resources and have committed resources from my office um, to this work. And I think that is how we are going to deal with a lot of these problems and move uh, solutions more to community-based and, and community-led public safety solutions. It's not easy, it's not gonna happen overnight. I still have a, not a day job um, to step in when needed, but put, put, put more of the uh, responsibility and the onus and partnership with community stakeholders. And I do believe that is the solution for uh, Brooklyn and New York City in general and probably across the country. Rachel, can I add in, because I, I think that's such a great question, and, and I think Eric's answer you know, exemplifies many things that can be done. You, know, you, you can be a bully, use the bully pulpit of this elected position. You can convene and bring in public health or other partners. Um, you know, you can try to empower your community and recognize that this shouldn't be about them driving the change, it should be about empowering community to own the change and to try to be part of, of strengthening that social fabric. But I think very often that question has been an excuse that has helped to justify what elected prosecutors and more traditional prosecutors shouldn't do and should stop doing, which is namely use the, we don't yet have it all built up, we don't yet have it all funded, we don't yet have the social supports as an excuse to keep doing damage. Because what we need to stop doing is presume that punishment in the criminal legal system is the solution for people who are struggling with mental health issues or substance use issues or poverty or so much more. And I think at least if elected prosecutors can get out of the way, can stop doing damage, we often talk about the fact that if they can stop occupying space that social services and public health and others should be occupying, then the void gets created and others are more likely to fill it. But as long as the criminal legal system is occupying this space and presuming we can punish our way out of people who are you know, housing insecured or have all of these other struggles, we are gonna keep doing damage and driving toward a false presumption of what solutions look like. Right, I, I run trains on time, so I'm gonna have us uh, uh, wrap up, but I wanted to thank all of you for the extraordinary work you're doing. It's very inspiring, I'm a cynic, but I really do like <laughs> reading about all the great things you're doing. It definitely makes me more optimistic uh, about what the future holds. So thank you all for joining us, and please join me in thanking this really great panel.